I am therefore delighted to see that there has been such a great response to our invitation um, and I'm confident that this discussion themes which will be covered today uh, have relevance uh, in your day-to-day -day running of businesses now and going forward. Uh, distinguished guests, uh, the accounting profession is being challenged day by day uh, as organizations are not immune to the prevailing economic uncertainties, the increasing regulatory requirements, investor and pressure group scrutiny. Uh, in a rapidly changing and demanding business environment, the role of the chief financial officer is critical in not only maintaining the credibility of the organizations, but also the profession at large. As you may be aware, Credibility is necessary in convincing market participants, government, the society as a whole to support your organization's objectives. And without this credibility, your potential to influence public confidence will be substantially impaired. Uh, the CFOs occupy a critical position in any organization holding the financial reins of uh, businesses and ensuring that resources are used wisely to secure uh, results. For those in a public service organization, achieving value for money um, and securing stewardship are key components of the chief financial officer's role. Over the last uh, two years, there, been, uh, uh, there has been uh, in question um, that particular stewardship as a number of financial mismanagement cases have been reported uh, concerning both the private and the public sectors. Um, with the enactment of the Public Financial Management Act and uh, its subsequent operationalization by the statutory instrument signed by the Minister of Finance last year, uh, the Institute expects a major shift in uh, management of public finances. Um, ladies uh, and gentlemen, I wish to take this opportunity to inform you that uh, the Zambia Institute of Chartered Accountants uh, entered into a property development uh, partnership and ownership agreement with the uh, Time Projects Property uh, Limited to be able to design, finance, build, operate, and, uh, and, and transfer after a 20 year period of uh, operations uh, an ultra modern multi purpose commercial property complex at the Accountants Park. Uh, if you go to the Zika uh, uh, property at the Accountants Park, you will find very visible large billboards that essentially are indicating that uh, uh, time has now commenced the pre-leasing uh, of prime space for the Accountancy, uh, for the Accountants Park. Uh, developments will only commence when we have achieved a 75 or above pre-leasing level, essentially uh, having tenants signed up on, on, on long-term leases and that would be signifying groundbreaking for the buildings. Um, we, uh, on a two hectare plot, uh, expect to be able to do at least eight commercial buildings. Um, um, we did a visit of uh, some of Time's uh, projects, uh, pro projects in uh, Botswana. Uh, Time, together with uh, the investment company Primetime, a Botswana listed company uh, with a market cap of uh, more than 400 million pullers. Uh, on the Botswana Stock Exchange in this market. They uh, own uh, Kablonga Central, Munali Mo, Chirundu, PWC Park, where there is Price Hotels and Cavmont, and uh, a number of other projects that they're developing. In the Botswana market, they are a very visible um, uh, player, uh, pretty much everywhere within Haberon and most uh, towns in that market. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my view that you will find today's discussions insightful and I urge all of you to take an active participation in the deliberations. I wish to take this opportunity once again to thank all the speakers, participants and the Zika management and staff for their input into making the CFO's forum a success. I therefore wish to declare this uh, CFO's uh, conference officially opened. I thank you. signed the SI on the 9th of May. It was published in the Gazette on the 10th of May. So when a statutory instrument comes into effect today, you give it a grace period of one day and it enters into force on the following day.
the laws were very, very fragmented. So an employer would come, they are looking at the Employment Act then as it was, and uh, then you would be saying, no, but you did not look at this other law, you did not look at this other law. And um, for most people, they are more interested in, you know, just getting to the bottom line, making money, and then while you're making money, labor officers also come in. So the Employment Court only talks about what we call individual employment law. That is a uh, right between an employer and an employee. So we have not touched the Industrial and Labor Relations Act. It's still sitting as a separate piece of legislation. So the code has included uh, new family-friendly rights. It has extended maternity leave provisions. They are now what we call a code family responsibility uh, leave provisions. Then uh, there are new provisions with the financial impact on summary dismissal. Um, so I had said before that the code does not prescribe everything, all right? So they, they, there's still room for the parties to still negotiate, to augment the stuff that is not in the code. So for instance, uh, you will not have provisions on, say, confidentiality. There is nothing in the code. But that doesn't mean you can't have such a provision in a contract or in conditions of service. Now, we will go into uh, a closer look at some of the new provisions. We have a new section 14, which uh, prioritizes employment of a citizen. Uh, so the HR people will tell you how this is going to be done, how you're going to, maybe by, you have to place an advert so that you can say, look, we advertised and no uh, citizen has come forward. Then um, you have um, a requirement to record an oral contract. There, there is a requirement for the employer to record the oral contract. Perhaps the, the not being a contract bit part comes um, when you say the, the employee is not required to sign on it, but you must keep a record of all the terms that you've agreed um, orally with the employee. So we say uh, don't bring contracts for attestation, only bring contracts for attestation if the employee is illiterate or the employee says they don't understand. You have every right to ask the employer to take the contract for attestation so the Ministry of Labor can have a look at it and then pass it off as a proper contract. Then uh, we have um, requirement for probation of three months now. I know the, the, there were institutions that, will have pro that currently have probation for six months. So now the law is saying it's three months, but with a possible um, uh, further extension yeah, of three months. <coughs> then after three months, you confirm. Because obviously by this time, you ought to know if the chap is not performing, let him go. Because if you keep them on longer and you confirm them, the provisions for termination of contract are quite stringent now. And uh, you'll be paying a lot of things. Gratuity is now law. Um, so you do not want to start incurring those expenses for somebody that uh, actually has not performed. Then. Um, Another important aspect I, uh, I, I thought to flag out was on the issue of transfer of contracts. So this happens when um, businesses have been sold or there's a merger, yeah? Um, that creates a lot of um, uncertainty and a lot of expense. So we went and said now in, that, in this employment court that where you, you transfer, by force, or you want to transfer by force and you do it, that action is void. And when you do that, the contract of employment of that particular employee terminates immediately. And when it terminates immediately, you need to pay them severance pay. So, you will notice in this law 
that uh, sometimes we are having to say uh, things. So when you walk like this and you step here and you step in the mud, you will not come and step on the mud because if you step on the mud, we will force you to scrub it. All right? We are having to say all of those things because of some of the experiences we've had on the labor market with very, very difficult employers. And uh, I remember when we went to Ministry of Justice, uh, Honorable Given Lubienda said to us that uh, this is a very emotional bill. It's full of emotions. And uh, you will see some of those emotions there. Uh, one of the emotions was in the definition of full pay. I don't know if any one of you has, has seen the definition of full pay. Have you guys read the employment code? <laughs> you have, eh? <laughs> okay. When we come to annual leave, we will talk about full pay there. typically reports the CEO, but in many cases they also have a seat on the board. <coughs> How many CFOs here have a seat on the board of directors? Well, there you are, quite a few. So these are directors on the board at the same time. The CFO assumes a number of strategic functions, and in particular, the CFO must take ownership and responsibility for the financial results of the organization. That is squarely on the shoulders of the CFO. It means that today's CFO, in order to be considered successful, you have to be what I can describe as a multifunctional executive with financial skills. I think that must be one of your goals to become a multifunctional executive. We talked about the leadership issues, providing strategic recommendation to the CEO and members of the executive team. But there's also the responsibility to advise on long-term business and financial planning. So let's look at the expectations. First, and I deliberately place this one as first, integrity. Can anybody tell me what your understanding of integrity is? What is integrity? To chief finance officers, Integrity is paramount. If a chief financial officer can exhibit integrity, that will reflect on the organization. The organization has integrity. The board also expects a lot of credibility from chief finance officers. What is credibility? Yes, ma'am. I think the ladies are the answers. You were going to say something about credibility. Yes? Maybe to be trustworthy or dependable. Trustworthy, dependable, particularly in the area of finances. In these days of money laundering and all kinds of things that go on. Corruption. The chief finance officer's working area is a very delicate area. It requires credibility. Well, accountability. The board expects you to be accountable for the mandate placed on your shoulders. This is an easy one because it sounds like accountant. <laughs> so what is accountability? Let me tell you, once I was in, um, in New York visiting a gentleman who at that time was the mayor of New York, 
and his name was Rudy Giuliani. Some of you have come across his name. Today he's one of the lawyers to President Trump. And I went into his office. He had his name on his table, and below the name were the words, I am accountable. I am responsible. I said, this sounds very lofty. What does it mean, Rudy? He said, well, you see, as mayor of the city of New York, everything that happens in this city, I am responsible and I'm accountable. Good or bad? And you know what happened on 11th of September, 2001? When those terrorists hit the World Trade Center building. You know who was one of the first people on the scene? Was the mayor, Giuliani. He says, something catastrophic has happened, and I'm accounting. The board expects you to exhibit reliability. You need to be reliable. These are principles of corporate governance, by the way. <coughs> If you've studied King 3 or King 4, there's a lot of importance placed now on retirement. <coughs> if the chief finance officer cannot be considered reliable, even the credibility of your output will not be considered credible. Tax, you know, tax is a very big subject. And I have known organizations where tax matters have not been well handled. And then the ZRA makes their own assessment, which goes into figures that will stagger anybody. So the board will expect the chief finance officer to be a tax strategist so that at all times your organization is compliant. I have just heard, for instance, that this new element of sales tax has been deferred, so it's supposed to kick in on Monday. Have you heard? Yes. Yeah, you should know. You're on top of your game. But this is an issue which you must be pondering already so that when you go to your boardrooms, you can advise the board appropriately and correctly. Uh, from what I have said, from the expectations of the board of directors, uh, the position of CFO is not only extremely demanding, but also extremely important. And if you have a good CFO, you can expect a buoyant organization. You can expect that the board will be able to navigate in difficult times. Resources, and we've been engaged to run with the Zika uh, property fund. And the moderator has asked me to try and make this into a KISS. He just says, keep it simple. That's a key, so keep it simple, stupid. That's what he said. So KISS. Let's keep this as simple as, as, as possible. Um, just as a background, is that as a 31st of uh, May um, 2019, we're basically sitting on uh, 4,124 unit, uh, unit holders with total units of about 17,847 and a fund position of 178,257. Now, we are trying to raise, you know, working towards uh, like $50 million, I think that's what the figure we're talking about. So it will take us a long time, probably in the next life, before we can get to that level, at the rate that we're going. But so far, it hasn't been uh, pretty bad. The whole idea is that 
put this money together is for office work. Okay. Um, this is a presentation which I think some of you have actually seen, and myself being Catholic, we always believe in repeating the same process so that people get to understand, but for this I'll save you the sermon by Nathan, I'll just try and go through um, um, some of the, this, this can be available to you. For those that were at the AGM, basically saw through the, the, the presentation in terms of what we need to be able to do. But the whole idea is that you as CFOs, it saves you an opportunity to look at potential office space and potential um, um, rental income to the same investment that you actually made. This particular project provides an opportunity for you as CFOs and potential SICA members to do what you might call a double job. Uh, so in the sense that you invest in one on one hand, and then you also look for potential office space in your own building, then you pay yourself rent, and then that way you also get to guarantee a certain, a certain return. I know that sometimes that doesn't get to over very well, but that's exactly what you need to be able to do. In the sense that as members of, uh, uh, of Zika, it would be nice and it's a, a beautiful thing to be able to talk about. I, I own part of the building, I pay myself rent, I also get a return. I mean, how else can you be able to guarantee an investment that besides, that provides you with a certain level of uh, risk mitigation for which most of you as CFOs don't like to discuss because a lot of CFOs don't like risk. But this in itself provides you that particular feature in the sense that as you pick your pay for, for, for buying the units, and potentially there's office space that Zika has, and you pick up that particular office space, then the opportunity of you picking up that particular office you, as long as you pay the rent. If you don't pay the rent, then whoever is managing the property, the, the property will be able to, 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 to take you away, or, or at least send you, close, close down your offices. So this is a summary of what this particular process is. But the Zika fund is duly registered under the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's going through an accumulation process, and, and the rationale is that each and every member is expected to contribute at least $2,500 over a period of time, so that then it allows you to raise the minimum, the minimum amount of money. So what has been done to date, okay? In the sense that um, there's been an agreement that's been entered into with a company called Time Project, and Time Project have a number of uh, uh, facilities that they're putting around here here in, in Lusaka, I think Monali Mall, Central Mall in Kabulonga, they're putting a mall somewhere in Kawanda, and, and they've also taken an interest to try and help work with Zika to develop these particular units that will be put up at the accountant's part. And the idea is that they said, if we work together with Zika, put up these facilities, we'll then work through a process where once the buildings are ready, and we found potential tenants that have guaranteed to take up uh, some of the office space. <coughs> we'll then put up the, the building in the event that, you know, when we, we put up the building, in the event that some of the spaces are not picked up, we will then guarantee, all right, at least the rental income of up to three, up to three years, okay, based on a yield of about 8%. That's the undertaking. So it means if someone from outside is able to come and see the opportunity and say, I'm willing to take this particular risk with, uh, um, with Zika. What stops you from making that decision to, on one go, invest, okay, and on, other part, on, on the other part, look at the opportunity that's available in terms of you paying rent to yourself. That's exactly what this program is all about. So I'm hoping, because I've been asked to try and minimize this, I hope I have been able to send across the message that needs to be able to get to you as CFOs of various things. As an introduction, and to be very quick, just talking about what is business strategy. So you're looking at course of actions that um, either is the owner of the business, the board, the CEO, who usually are the carriers of strategy, what course of actions, what set of decisions are being put across. And all these 
brought together with the right action plans will obviously give you the business objective that you are set out to uh, carry out. Now, when you look at business objective, there are many variant uh, definitions of it, but in a nutshell, it moves you from what your vision is, what your objective is, through the action plans and eventually achieving that. Through the journey of business strategy, finance has always played a role. So what we're now looking at is what has the evolution been? So you've got budgetary planning, which was pretty much financial control focused as one of the key issues that started. We moved on to corporate planning as a key focus. We moved on to corporate strategy, the PCG group, uh, growth share metrics. We moved on to industry and competitive analysis, Potter's five forces as a way of coining a business strategy in delivering the objective of the organization. We then looked at internal sourcing of competitive advantage. What advantage do you have as a business? And that is what you stick out with. We've got classic examples of Nokia, and you all know what happened to Nokia when they chose not to move with time. Because you think that you've got the core competence and you're just going to drive that from a business strategy perspective. We looked at uh, the 2000, early 2000 strategic innovation and implementation. There was a very famous catchword, balance scorecard. I'm sure everyone went through that. Then you see that all these are strategies, business strategies that people have been adopting over the period of time in terms of how do they then run the business. And lastly, the era we are in, and I'm indebted to Mr. Chisanga on this particular one, where he ably dealt with the issues around strategic thinking and simplification. How do you read into the happenings of the economy, for example? It's not a snapshot anymore. A lot of dynamics are happening, things are changing. And here we're now seeing CFOs, finance functions, as required to be thinking and resolving issues on the go. Because every day something is popping up. We've got the employment code. We've got the sales tax. We've got um, TP. Who knows what TP is? ZRA is so active on TP now. Transfer pricing. All these are things which keep on popping up every day. And if you remain static, how do you then deal with the dynamics that the uh, world is presenting to you. Ha! Ah, here's the slide. And this is owing to what Mr. Chisaka did. He ably explained to us what finance and all that is. The expectation, what is sitting on the job description of a CFO and all that. I've coined it in only one thing. Okay, the picture is not very clear, but that's actually a beauty. And from a finance perspective, all that has been said points to all the lights being off in a building and you see a CFO sitting there with uh, the light on. But actually, what is it that is going on uh, in the CFO's mind? When you look at the perception of the role of the finance function, or is it of the CFO, you find that it's coined around three areas. PwC, I've called it business insights, transactional efficiency, compliance, and control. So these are the three key areas that a CFO or a finance function is going to contribute towards the uh, business strategy of the organization. And following from uh, the presentation of the previous speaker, you find that business insight becomes very critical in this time and age. And in business insight, we're talking about strategy and planning, budgeting, forecasting, business analysis, performance improvements, tax planning, all those things that form an integral uh, part when it comes to formulation of strategy and also direction that the board or the CEO can actually give you. PwC has called it uh, business insights. Here it's being called decision support. These are very critical critical activities that the CFO and the finance function is to contribute to the overall business strategy. 
So what is finance function and business strategy? In my view, is strategic thinking and simplification. You have to be thinking on the go. But how do we then crystallize this into the whole topic that we're discussing today? You forgive an accountant. I tried to do some color combinations. Ah. <laughs> it always doesn't work. So, one of the things, again, this is uh, an insight from one of the studies for CFOs, is that we need to turn the finance pyramid. Rises, you cannot then seek to appoint arbitrators and hope that you can deal with it in Zambia. You would have to go to where that place, the place defined in your arbitral, closed. That's where the case must be handled. So if you have said our case will be heard in Rome, and let's suppose that uh, um, it's a case of you as a small, medium enterprise, you are dealing with a big boy like Mopani, for example, and you sign an agreement and there's that arbitral clause. The big boys would say, we will deal with it in Rome. And because you are under pressure, you need to make some shinga for your children, you sign. In case of a dispute, you would have to get on the plane and go away. So I'm saying to us as accountants, please watch for the arbitral clauses that we have in our contracts. Read it and seek to understand it. With that said, said enough wrong thing. Let me see if I can proceed quickly now. Um, so the idea is we are looking for alternative places where, you know, a dispute must be resolved instead of having to go to court. Currently, these are the networks uh, of countries where this is practiced. Um, there are about 133 countries, and more than 16,000 DR practitioners, the nine branches in Africa. These are the branches that does exist uh, in Africa. What services? Um, does the um, institute provide? It does provide education, it does train, it trains arbitrators, it, it trains mediators, it trains adjudicators. And I will give us a bit of detail so to understand um, um, what those are, the differences. It also acts as a global hub for practitioners, policymakers, academicians, and those in business to support the global promotion, facilitation, and development of all ADR mechanisms. Okay, that's basically what this thing uh, does on the global, on the global level. As a branch, we have the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators um, in Zambia as a branch. Uh, this branch was set up in 2011, uh, registered in September of uh, that, uh, that same year under the Societies Act, and the, the first branch committee was elected in 2012. And uh, it, was, it was given recognition order by means of justice as an arbitral institution in Zambia uh, on the 9th January 2015. What does the branch do? That's a local branch now. Uh, this is what it does. It provides training in adjudication. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Mediation and arbitration. But also the branch, the local branch that we have in Zambia appoints uh, arbitrators and mediators. Now what will happen is, um, um, in your relationship, you, you can define under that arbitral clause and say, should we have a dispute, we mandate the, um, the issue to the branch to appoint the mediators. Um, now, what is an alternative dispute resolution? I think that's that's, that's an important thing that uh, we need to, uh, to try and define. An alternative dispute resolution is a range, or a range of procedures that serve as alternatives to litigation, which I've been talking about. Uh, litigation happens through the courts of law, um, but arbitration happens outside of the courts of law. Or alternative dispute resolving mechanisms happens outside of the courts of law. The beauty with the, uh, this uh, uh, alternative way of resolving disputes is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the people, the players that are involved in resolving the disputes are very, very neutral. Uh, 
but as we shall see uh, later on, uh, they are so neutral and so impartial uh, that uh, you know if there must be any clear, any clear air that shows a bit of impartiality, or just any bit of iota that shows that they are not neutral, at that point they can be disqualified. That's the only ground at which you know when you do um, uh, what is a judgment in litigation. Um, but um, uh, when you know when that is done, uh, when you give an award in arbitration, when an award, an award is given, it can only be challenged. An award stands at the same uh, the same level with the judgment from the high court. So if he, you the two disputants came to me and they, you know looked at your case and an award was given, that award stands at par with the judgment from the judges at the high court. All I have to do is that get that award, register with the high court, that's it. And the only time and place at which it can be challenged is if there's no neutrality and impartiality in the process. So one of the things that we did was to survey CFOs. 1,700 CFOs across the world in terms of what their expectations for the future, what they think the challenges are. And four key challenges came up. One is legislation and regulation. Uh, the second one is talent. Third one is digital disruption. And the fourth one was uh, cost. Okay. So I'll go into some of them. So talent. Uh, some of these things are very small, but you get the slides, you read, you know, um, and I think many of you have heard this say it, 50% uh, of the jobs that were there 10 years ago don't exist anymore. I don't know how many of you have heard that stuff. And it's true, okay? The talent that you have now might be so ill-fitted for your needs over the next five years. As a CFO, the people that you have, I mean, I remember talking to a CFO once when we were talking about IFRS 9 and we were saying, listen, so you probably need mathematical in uh, engineers and so on. And they said, where am I going to get those? But the fact is, things have changed. How many of you thought you'd be employing mathematicians just three, four years ago? Now you are. Uh, if you look at our firm, for example, I was um, blown away to discover how we have 260 medical doctors. Yeah, these are not doctors because they studied MBAs and whatever, or you know, PhDs, but they are medical doctors. Because we have to answer the needs of our medical um, clients. Within, even here in Zambia, for example, we employ mathematicians, we employ economists, we employ lawyers, we employ all sorts of things. And this is a tax function. That's how complicated life has become uh, for all of us. So, talent. And one of the interesting things about um, this survey is 98% of companies, okay? 98% of companies believe your core competencies will shift from traditional accounting. 98% of all the companies, okay? So debit and credit and all these nice things you did, from good and whatnot. In future, we might just have to throw from good. Uh, what was the other one? I can see one of my classmates here. It was that Colin Drury. <laughs> I'm, I'm reminding you of the trauma that you suffered in those days. Okay. Um, skills shortages. So 89% when we did that survey. 89% of CFOs say skill shortage is an issue. And many times we get asked, come on, universities are turning out graduates, CBU, UNSA, and so on. Why do people talk about skills shortages? And this is something that we are trying to talk to these institutions of ours. But many times the graduates there, they keep turning out, are so ill suited for the needs of the modern corporate world. And I'm sure many of you attest to that. You put somebody on a desk, they bring you an Excel spreadsheet and it's all hard-coded. And you're wondering what happened to formulas. You know, basic things like that. Uh, 
um, it's happening every day. So that sudden CFO, 89%, that's a large number. The 1,700 CFOs that we surveyed, they all say it's skills shortage will be an issue. Regulatory change, again, 87% concerned about regulation. Even in Zambia, I'm sure, today you are all on your phone sales tax. What not? You know, so regulatory change, big issue, 89%. Okay? So responding to tax legislation and reform. So I found it interesting when um, uh, Mr. Tsanga asked the question about sales tax. You know, how many of you have done a comparison and so on? That's an important question. It's here. You know, transfer pricing, BEPS agenda, and so on. That's all the reputational risk. Big issue. Okay? Um, I'm on that accountants. What is that accountants forum on WhatsApp? How many people are on that? So I saw my friend mentioned it and I kept very quiet. <laughs> because, you know, reputational issues are hectic. And in many instances, the people who comment don't even understand what they are talking about. But you know, we call it a, a tabloid test. You know, if it appears in the mast, what will it be written like and what will people see? Okay? It's not what you know as an organization. So it's reputational risk. So tax has high reputational risk. 64% yeah? very concerned. 93% okay. When you look at uh, regulatory change, and this is important, you know the traditional silos of finance, supply chain, legal, they are all being blown up. You cannot maintain a structure that has those traditions of finance. We are finance. You know, one of the things um, that companies need to consider is infusing teams. So the finance team, you have somebody from legal sitting there and so on. Why? It's so important. These clauses that Mr. Mbambiko was talking about, many times I have dealt with situations from the tax perspective, for example, where you find a CFO who didn't even read the most important agreement when they run into problems. Like sales tax, for example, there are so many clients that are struggling to just change their agreement because suddenly your agreement has no scope for changing anything because of tax changes. That's supposed to be obvious, but nobody read that contract. Okay? So collaboration with other functions, important. That's the future. You cannot operate as a finance team and forget about everybody. appreciate that and we hope to see you in our next workshop. Um, there are two things which has come up today. We have been challenged as accountants, as CFOs to say we need to go and drill holes on the Employment Code Act. So I would like us to when we get back to our respective offices, to find time and read that code. And where you have a gray area or you think there's something which needs to be done by Zika, you can make a submission to via email uh, to technical at zika.co.za. Same usual email that we use to send you workshop updates. You can just send us back an email for submission so that we can pick that up before that time or that window closes. So that we'll be able to share something which we are taking as Zika to the Labor Commissioner or to the Ministry of Labor to address those gray areas which the Assistant Labor Commissioner has been pointed. So we expect that to be done, I think, before the end of July. If you are able to send the submission, we will be very grateful. On our side as well, we'll do a paper to make sure that is it address and we will share with the members. Um, our team is there behind. Because next after the um, closing remarks is the networking and social interaction. Definitely, when we are getting the tea, we can't leave it for the hotel, we have paid for this. So please find time to, to pass to the tea for your behind.